While invasive approaches are expensive, pose risk to the patient, and are largely confined to the lab, non-invasive neurotechnologies can be deployed more immediately to help people. The P300 speller, for example, allows people to provide text input by just looking at the letter they want on the screen. While this is slower than invasive approaches, it can be done on a headset and software that runs on a personal computer for less than $1,000. Non-invasive approaches, in comparison to invasive ones, suffer from more limited signal-to-noise ratios, decreased ability to target specific areas, and crosstalk from unrelated body areas due to their distance from the neuron they are recording from. On the other hand, they have strengths in their ease of adoption and use, are generally cheaper, and pose limited to no risk of permanent physiological damage or change. Hi, I'm Harrison Canning, and in this video we are going to cover non-invasive neurotechnologies. Because these technologies don't require surgery and their usage is widespread, many of them are quite accessible. If you have ever had an MRI, CAT scan, or used any type of mind-reading toy, you have encountered non-invasive neurotech. We're going to start with electroencephalography, which thankfully we can shorten to EEG. EEGs are a good place to start because they have been around for a really long time, are pretty cheap, portable, and easy to set up. Because of this, they are the most common method for brain-computer interfacing. You can buy consumer EEG devices like the Motive EPOC, OpenBCI Ultracortex, or the Muse2 for a few hundred to a thousand US dollars. So how does this work? EEG shows us brain data collected from electrodes placed on top of the head. Recall from our neuroscience videos that there are several biological layers between the electrodes and the brain, meaning that signals tend to be particularly small and get a little scrambled. For context, a little AA battery produces about 1.5 volts, or 25,000 times the charge of the average EEG signal we pick up. Because the electrodes are far from the brain, the data we are collecting comes from a pretty large area. Even with a lot of electrodes, the smallest area that we can isolate is about 6 to 8 centimeters squared. In other words, EEG has poor spatial resolution. The term spatial resolution is used to quantify the size of the area that can be sampled. It increases as the individual sample area goes down, like the resolution of a computer monitor. As a reminder, temporal resolution measures how quickly data can be accessed. EEG data is processed near instantaneously, meaning it has very high temporal resolution. Okay, so these tiny signals are collected by the electrodes, but they have to be amplified and filtered before we can start making sense of them. This can be done through hardware on the headset or through software later down the line. This information is then sent to a computer so that we can make use of the data, either for medical diagnosis or to control a device. The information is displayed as a scribbly line. This is where the term brainwave comes from. Neuroscientists have found patterns in data that are often categorized into delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma waves. Looking at the data, we can see big peaks and valleys on the delta side of the spectrum and many tiny spikes on the gamma beta end. You might think that big swoops of the delta waves mean that there is a lot of activity, but the opposite is true. With EEG and other technologies measuring neuroelectric signals, we are actually measuring synchronicity, not big spikes. Think about it. The signals are small, so we can't measure single neurons. Instead, big spikes tend to mean that a lot of neurons are firing together which is indicative of most stages of sleep. When you're thinking really hard, lots of areas are firing out of sync, meaning that they cancel spikes out. This is like waves on a beach. Waves coming from a single direction combine to form one large wave, but waves colliding cancel out. Okay, so we have our data. Now, what can we do with it? Well, I mentioned above that it can be used for medical applications. Pretty much since the invention of EEG, it has been useful in monitoring epileptic individuals for seizures. Seizures create an abnormality in the wave patterns that inform the doctors when a seizure occurs. EEGs can be used to detect brain tumors as well, in addition to providing doctors comprehensive information about a patient's vital signs and sleeping patterns. For brain-computer interface applications, the data can be fed into a computer which will look for predefined data patterns so that it may execute a task. The recent advancements in computer technologies have allowed neurotechnologists to create machine learning algorithms based on these brainwave signal features, such as patterns and noise. To understand how this works, imagine you want to be able to detect when the user moves their right arm up. 
you could ask them to move their arm up and down some number of times while recording data from their motor cortex. After giving the computer information about when the action is happening, it could look for patterns in the data and extrapolate a specific signature that means the user is moving their arm. The computer would then look for this signature pattern in real time and use it to trigger some predetermined action. But EEG is by no means perfect. There are still many challenges such as variability in certain patient groups, variability within subjects over time, background electromagnetic noise, and signal artifacts from the scalp and eye muscle movement. When EEG was first being used, labs would have different methodologies for placing electrodes. This made it really hard to translate results across labs. This inconsistency led researchers to create the 1020 system, which uses percentages of the user's head circumference and other measurements to ensure consistency in placement. Other, more specific systems have been developed as electrode count has increased, but you'll see the 1020 system most often. Let's shift gears to talk about magnetoencephalography. MEG is similar to EEG in methodology, but reads the brain's magnetic fields rather than its electric fields. MEG's spatial resolution is better than EEG, while still maintaining high temporal resolution. One of the main drawbacks to MEG, however, is the size of the signal-to-noise ratio, which is several orders of magnitude worse than EEG. As a result, MEG usually requires a magnetically shielded room to produce usable results. Everything from eye blinks to heartbeats, and even the Earth's magnetic field, play a role in undesirable noise in MEG. There is some hope that MEGs may soon make their way out of the lab. BCI company Kernel has been working on a type of MEG called Optically Pumped Magnetometers, or OPMEG, that has shown success in reducing noise in a portable MEG device. Another non-invasive technology is functional near-infrared spectroscopy, or FNIRS. This technique involves the application of near-infrared light and recording on the surface of the scalp. FNIRS suffers from some very unique weaknesses, including interference from outside light sources. The technique is extremely similar to a PPG, which is a little device that goes on your finger when you're at the doctor's. FNIRS has a pretty significant drop-off of signal quality the farther you get from the brain, so it is important to position the sensors as close to the scalp as possible. All of the technology so far has been about recording from the brain, but what about the peripheral nervous system? EMG, or electromyography, and ENG, or electroneurography, allow us to do just that. EMG and ENG are functionally very similar. EMG measures muscle activation, tensing your muscle produces a large response, and ENG measures signals directly from the nerves. Invasive forms of both technologies exist, but non-invasive forms are much more commonly used. Because muscles and peripheral nerves are more isolated and aren't covered by the skull, the signals are larger and easier to work with. This makes them really good for hackathon projects. EMG is commonly used as a control switch for cosplay costumes to control prosthetics or clinically to measure muscle activation. Let's transition to talk about general medical imaging technologies. These are typically used by doctors for computer-aided diagnosis or for medical research. Neuroimaging, or brain scanning, refers to a group of technologies that image structure and or function of the brain and nervous system. Structural imaging shows us the shape of the brain, and functional imaging gives insight into how specific brain areas work. The widespread adoption of neuroimaging devices has given neuroradiologists, who are specialists that work directly with this technology, an invaluable and low-risk way to peer inside living brains while inflicting little to no harm to the patient. The wide breadth of imaging technologies is useful in diagnosis of many physical and psychological ailments, is useful for ongoing monitoring, and has given researchers deeper insight into the inner workings of tens of billions of neurons in the brain. The broad adoption of these technologies since the late 20th century has led to a massive influx of new research that many dub the era of the brain. Structural imaging gives insight into the gross structure and topography of the brain and nervous system. This can be useful for identifying physical abnormalities caused from injury or tumors. Common examples of structural imaging are MRI and CT CAT scans. Functional imaging looks at the brain's metabolic processes to identify smaller lesions, abnormalities in neural functioning, and identify active sites in the brain. Some technologies, such as fMRI, overlay functional imaging on top of structural imaging to provide further insight. Magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, is a structural imaging technique that makes use of magnetic fields and radio frequency energy. MRI creates black and white images in 2D called slices, which can later be compiled into a complete 3D model. 
This is similar to how individual bread slices can combine to make a complete loaf. If you've ever had an MRI, you can request your raw files and use a service like BrainKey, which turns your MRI data into an interactable 3D model of your brain for free. This service also allows you to create a 3D printable file that lets you print your own brain. Since MRI scans are non-invasive and pose few health risks, you can get several of these models and look at how your brain changes over time. This property has allowed researchers to learn more about brain development and doctors the ability to monitor brain health. One disadvantage is that the patient has to hold still for a very long period of time in a noisy, cramped space while the image is being performed. These models help doctors to identify major lesions in the brain and growth structure, but don't give insight into how the brain is functioning. For that, we need to look at fMRI. Functional MRI identifies active brain regions over time by measuring blood flow in the brain, which changes in response to activity. The idea is, when an area of the brain is being used, the neurons need more energy to function and require increased blood flow. By measuring this, we can watch as different areas of the brain light up or become active. This information is then overlaid onto an MRI model to show functional relationship to location. This is the primary way, in recent decades, that neuroscientists have identified how different brain functions work, or at least what areas they are associated with. A cool example of this is the Brain Dictionary. Researchers played a two-hour-long broadcast to participants and monitored which areas of the brain lit up for each word that was played. They then overlaid this information onto a brain model, which you can find linked below. This doesn't necessarily mean that each of these areas is where that word is stored or processed, but it is interesting nonetheless. The final imaging technology we will look at is positron emission tomography, or PET. PET is a functional device that measures levels of glucose in the brain in order to illustrate where neural firing is taking place. This works because active neurons use glucose as fuel. As part of the scan, a tracer substance attached to radioactive isotopes is injected into the blood, when parts of the brain become active, blood, which contains the tracer, is sent to deliver oxygen to the active areas. The detectors are able to track the location of the tracer, which can then be overlaid onto a structural model. This creates visible spots, which are then picked up by detectors and used to create a video image of the brain while performing a particular task. However, with PET scans, we can only locate generalized areas of the brain activity and not specific locations. In addition, PET scans are costly and pose some risk as a radioactive tracer has to be injected, making their use limited. However, they can be used in some forms of medical diagnosis, including Alzheimer's. Researchers have gained insight by combining these technologies in order to map the human brain. The Human Connectome Project used information from many imaging technologies to create maps of neural pathways in the brain. This has resulted in information-rich and gorgeous images. In this video, we discussed the many forms of non-invasive neurotechnology and neuroimaging devices. We covered EEG, MEG, EMG, FNIRS, fMRI, and PET. By and large, the technologies discussed in this lesson are used for recording. In the next lesson, we will look at some stimulatory techniques and devices.